Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organization for inviting us, the club, and myself to be here today. It's a pleasure to join this time with all of you. Um, in this second session, as has been told, we'll be talking about uh, medial collateral uh, ligament. As you might understand, probably there will be a lot of uh, overlapping knowledge in all these uh, different lectures. So I'll try to go uh, just to the basic uh, uh, anatomy, uh, biomechanics, mechanism of injury, and epidemiology. So the rest of the lectures dedicated to surgery, probably they will go deeper in the anatomy and perhaps in biomechanics. About the MCL, uh, we must recognize that it's a very evolving knowledge as uh, Laprade in his recent paper in the, uh, in t this, this month, uh, he recognized that most of the knowledge that we have about MCL is pretty historical. If we review all the anatomy, uh, uh, it hasn't changed from the early 1940s of uh, last century uh, or the description that were in this in the 1970s. However, nowadays we have a better knowledge of every structure that can form the MCL complex, as we'll see. And it will really help us to uh, realize and find a better, better way to do the uh, surgical reconstruction and also do the uh, conservative treatment. MCL is the most frequently injured ligament in all series publishers. Um, it has a frequency in the US of 0 0.24 per thousand uh, players. Any, at any given year. Uh, as we will see, it remains quite the same in footballers. Intrinsically, it's twice as frequent in males, it's 0 0.36 over the 0 0.18 that in females. Normally, in football, we find isolated tears. As we know, uh, knee is a multi-axial joint, so we find it also in combined injuries, normally with ACL or any other structures. But in our media, in football, normally we find isolated tears. Mainly affect young indiv individuals. We will see some epidemiological reviews on even professional uh, footballers and also youngsters from our, even our own data from the academy. And it affects youngs a lot. And mainly we will review the two mechanism of injury. There is no big deal on it. It's just a valgus stress mechanism that it can be uh, taken in place by the uh, direct stress or indirect stress. As I said, the anatomy of the medial aspect of the knee has, been, has remained, uh, from a historical point of view, uh, haven't changed much until the last, I would say, the last eight or ten years after the work of Griffith and uh, Laprade group that we've been uh, getting a lot of more knowledge of the anatomic uh, components of this medial aspect and the biomechanical role. Now we know that the static portion of the medial aspect of the knee, which we call the static stabilizers, er, they are conformed by the superficial medial collateral ligament, the deep medial collateral ligament, and the posterior oblique ligament. There are also a predominant role of some dynamic stabilizers. Unfortunately, the, really, the real role of these stabilizers is not really identified yet because all the biomechanical studies, wonderful studies in any case, they're done on cadaver. So we don't have uh, exact data of the role of these dynamic stabilizers as the muscle tendon union of semimembranous muscle, quadriceps, in this case, in this case uh, vastus medialis muscle, and pes anterior. The role, however, we know is very predominant as uh, we know that it really helped the st static stabilizers to do their job. And that's the reason perhaps the, all the amateur players, the so-called weekend warriors, they have a lot of more problem sustaining their medial collateral complex. I'll do a real briefing on the anatomy. I, as I said, I, I believe on the surgical approach, we will get a deeper um, knowledge on it. The superficial MCL is uh, posterior to the medial epicondyl of the femur. It's extracapsular. It's a lateral. It's the largest structure of, of the lateral 
aspect of the knee, the, excuse me, the medial aspect of the knee. It has two attachments, one, of, uh, one uh, attachment in the femur and two in the tibia. The interesting thing about the two attachments in tibia, it is a proximal one, which is one centimeter below the joint line, is uh, not attached directly to the bone, but to the soft tissue. The distal insertion, which is six centimeters around the joint line, is attached directly to the bone. Thus, that, as we will see, it will confer biomechanical, different biomechanical properties, properties to each one of them. And probably, the, uh, when we need to do some surgical reconstruction, it's important to keep it in mind. Now, you can see here in the green ones the uh, uh, proximal attachment and the distal attachment. Injury of this, either one of them, could result in a bagus classically in the bagus external rotation or anterior medial instability. The deep MCL is, a, is really a thickening of the uh, joint capsule deep to the surface MCL. It, atta it attaches in the femur one centimeter below the uh, superficial MCL, attached to the medial meniscus, and from there goes to the uh, tibia approximately 0 0.5 centimeters below, below the joint line. The posterior <laughs> oblique ligament has been classically referred in literature as an oblique portion of the superficial MCO. Uh, in literature, we can get the idea that it's not really a separate structure rather than thickening of the posterior, posterior medial joint capsule. It has mainly three components but we will focus on the central component, the, the so-called central arm of the posterior obliquo ligament that is an extension of the distal aspect of semimembranous tendon blending with the capsule reinforcement. As you can imagine, these three structures, they run all together, they co-work together, and um, we will, uh, from a surgical point of view, at, at times it's difficult to differentiate them, but as I said, uh, and we will review the biomechanics right now, uh, it's important to know the role of each one of them in order to do a correct or more precise anatomical reconstruction. This, uh, I will present briefly data from the Griffith paper of 2009 published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine. I feel this is a wonderful biomechanic paper. Um, as I said, they only take into account the static stabilizers. You can see in this one, the, in the green, um, well, actually, I see a green, blue, uh, blue bar, the uh, posterior oblique ligament, the yellow one with the uh, proximal surface attachment, proximal surface medial collateral ligament attachment, and in the um, green one, the distal bony attachment of the medial collateral ligament. It was uh, load applied in the valgus stress, and now you can see here how at uh, 30 and 60 degrees, the distal attachment of the superficial medial collateral ligament has the highest response, while the uh, proximal has a very stable response, and the posterior oblique ligament only activates in full extension. That's why we know the valgus stress, when we have a, an injury of the superficial MCL, we will easily detect at 30, 30 to 60 degrees of stress. But what happens when we apply external rotation stress to these structures? Now, the non-bony attachment, the proximal attachment of the superficial medial collateral ligament that is attached to soft tissue, has a predominant role in all of a range of motion studies, 0, 20, 30, and 60, except for the full <coughs> extension at 90 degrees. Okay. Once again, the posterior ligament remains uh, very equivalent during all the uh, grace explode. Finally, in ro internal rotation, we, I, just, I will just point out the role of the posterior oblique ligament in the stability of the knee, especially at zero degrees, where we can um, realize that is the most activated component being always superior to the surface a superficial, pardon, and um, deep uh, distal 
attachment of the superficial medial collateral ligament. I will not talk, I, will, I just took away the ones regarding the anterior and posterior instability role of the medial complex because it's not really clear in literature if they have a predominant role while we have integrity of these structures. The mechanism of injury most, most frequent we see in footballers is a direct blow, as I said, and you can see in the picture, with foot planted and direct bottles in different degrees of flexion. It's unclear in the literature what structures get injured first, but it's described that the first one to go in this mechanism is the uh, superficial MCL, then the distal uh, MC, uh, the deep MCL, and finally the posterior oblique ligament. This will be, if we can get the video running, the usual, okay. It's pretty demonstrative. Probably there is more than a medial collateral ligament there because there's some rotary effect on it. But this, this will be the most common injury mechanism that we is described in literature and we feel that we have. It will represent about two thirds from a 60 to 75% of all of medial collateral ligament injuries. The second mechanism is valgus stress with tibial rotation that we use in pivoting and cutting. And cutting as in basketball or even soccer. However, for us, it represents only one third of all of the MCL that we uh, detect. This will be, it's not ex exactly the same mechanism. This is a kind of odd injury because the, there is no play going on there. The, they're just waiting to, for the goalkeeper to shoot the ball and the, the player decides to kick the ball just at the exact moment where the Goalkeeper is trying to push the ball. So bam, he gets this valgus stress and gets the sorry, indirect mechanism. Okay? It's not very frequent, but I think it's very demonstrative. Finally, we will review briefly the epidemiology. As I already said, it's a most frequently injured ligament. In soccer also, as, as we'll see, only superior by the ankle ligaments. Uh, 0.24, as I said, at any given year in the U.S. population. But in football players, the excellent study published in 1911, uh, 2011, excuse me, it, it takes, it gives us this data that is the fourth most frequent injury, accounting for the 5% of all injuries and representing 0.41 of uh, all, for every thousand hours of exposure. The average absence described for these injuries is 23 days, which will be this so-called three weeks, okay? The uh, frequency during the season, as you can see, the four ligaments is quite stable during the whole years. It remains quite the same. We have the same as uh, we do in our club. And during the year, they remain really, really stable throughout the years, as you can see in the portal line. What about the youngest players? What happens in the academies? We have data from England, Portugal, and France. Um, England, just uh, all of them repeat the same data we already exposed. MCL is the most common ligament injury. It represents around 17, 15% of all knee injuries. It happens in a contact situation, 75% of the time, and during competitive or match play in 60% of the time. Portugal didn't show any specific data on MCL, only in the discussion they just referred us they had the same data as it was published, and France, pretty much the same. Finally, this is our data from the last four years. We had three players during this period in the pro team. Uh, we, we've only had two MCL injuries, both of them in the same player. In our academy, uh, we have 400 players during the time. We, we've had 23. And in our indoor soccer team, we had 70 players. We had three. That pretty much gets fits really well into the this, uh, published data. In summary, and I'll be finishing, it's an evolving knowledge. I'm sure we will have uh, much more biomechanical data especially from uh, <clears throat> uh, the dynamic part of the medial complex. We have statics and dynamic stabilizers. We have to remind that. There is always uh, 
could be with, we could think on a bulbous rotational or anterior posterior stability when we detect an injury. It's the most frequently injured ligament of the knee in footballers, only uh, below the ankle ligaments. And the mechanism of injuries is always a bulbous stress by a direct or indirect uh, mechanism. That's all. Thank you very much for your attention.